and we're live. Okay, so we're continuing with uh, compound interest and logarithms. Uh, goal for today is to work with exponential growth and decay um, and to compare and contrast exponential growth and decay to um, our normal discrete compound interest. So this is our formula from last time um, for compound interest. Um, the thing I'm going to focus on is our, um, our R and our N today. Um, so our rate that we're gathering interest and the number of times that we compounded. And last time we saw if we increased N, um, then we would increase the amount of interest that we would get at the end of the year, right? Well, if we keep doing that, we'll actually hit an upper limit. So here I've got um, one RMB. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. I've got one RMB increasing at 100% interest rate for one year. Um, compounded annually, so that's at the end of the year, 12 times, 100 times, a million times, and a billion times. You can see my numbers are increasing, um, but we do hit an upper limit where there's not really a difference between a million times and a billion times. So what's happening there? <laughs> Um, is we're approaching this upper value that we call e. Um, e is sort of like pi, it's a constant. The value doesn't change. It's also an irrational number like pi. It's a decimal that never repeats and continues forever. And we could define it as um, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n power. Where if you want to think about this in terms of our compound interest formula, then that would mean... That would mean something like this, um, where we had a principal of $1, growing at a 100% interest rate. Um, for one year, but compounded infinitely many times. So if I take the limit as n approaches infinity, would be e. So this is the most that you could possibly compound something when it increases by 100%. Um, at the end of the year, if we were compounding every instant from the start of the year to the end of the year. Um, any questions so far? No. No. Okay. Um, so that brings us to our exponential growth and decay formula. You'll notice it's really similar to what we had with our compound interest formula. Um, there is a substitution here. Um, I did not prove it on this slide. Um, if you guys want it, uh, message me on WeChat and I'll send you the proof. Um, there is quite a bit of calculus and logarithms involved. Um, I didn't feel like we'd covered quite enough in order to get there yet. Um, however, before the end of the year, I will go back and reprove this again. Um, so this is our exponential growth and decay, and what we're basically doing is we're replacing that inner part, so that 1 plus r over n raised to the n. Um, we're replacing with e raised to the r power, which just means we are compounding infinitely many times within that rate. Um, but it is really the same formula, we're just making a substitution. Yeah. Um, so whereas um, for our discrete compound growth, um, we typically use that for finance. So whether you're taking out a loan um, or you're gaining interest on an investment, um, exponential growth is almost never used for money. And that's because no bank on earth is going to give you continuous compound interest. Um, and you're never going to be able to continuously gain interest on an investment. Um, so instead, applications for exponential growth typically deal with some sort of a population growth. Um, so we'll be looking at a lot of population growths, so whether that's um, bacteria in a petri dish, um, which would increase exponentially up until it hits half of your carrying capacity. Um, what I mean by that is there's only so much space in a petri dish, so it does increase exponentially, but there is a point where you'll run out of resources, in this case space. Um, you'll have less room to grow, so it can't continue to increase exponentially in the real world. Um, but theoretically, um, if you had all the space and all the food and all the time in the world, um, you could increase exponentially for that bacteria um, up until the point where it um, starts to hit those constraints. 
Um, so population growth is exponential for, um, you could say, half of its graph until it reaches half of the carrying capacity of the environment. Um, radioactive decay, um, so this is what we use in order to date objects. Um, so we could check to see, um, based, based on the half-life of an element, um, how much mass of an element is going to be um, remaining. Um, we could also do pressure differences al at altitude, which we'll take a look at in a minute, um, or temperature of a preheated object compared to surrounding temperature, um, which we'll take another look at after in another slide after this. Um, so again, though, my key difference is um, when we're using our formula from last class, we're looking at discrete growth. So your growth happens in intervals, um, monthly or quarterly or annually. Um, but it, all of your growth, all of your interest that you're gaining happens at once. Versus um, our formula we're using today, all of your growth or all of your decrease is happening all the time. So it's not monthly, it's not quarterly, it's just there's infinitely many changes um, happening at that rate. Any questions on the difference? No. Okay. No. Um, let's get into some problems. Um, so I've got one problem that I've already worked out here that I'm just going to talk about, and then I've got another problem that I'm going to work out um, during the live session. So here I've got atmospheric pressure that's decreasing um, approximately exponentially as elevation increases. The rate of decrease is determined to be 11.8% per kilometer, and the pressure at sea level is 753 millimeters of mercury. Um, this measurement is... Um, so you're looking at the, uh, it's the sort of like the volume of the mercury that you have. Mercury is really susceptible to pressure or temperature differences. So in a thermometer, um, we use mercury to check those differences. And we can do the same thing for pressure. So um, I've got 753 millimeters of mercury and I wanna know what the pressure is at 4.6 kilometers above sea level. Um, so I'm using our formula, A of T equals P E to the RT. We're starting at 753 millimeters of mercury at sea level, and then that amount is decreasing by 11.8% for every kilometer above sea level that we travel. Um, so my rate is negative 0.118 uh, kilometers. Um, and we're doing this for 4.6 kilometers. Um, so I plug all of that into a calculator, and um, you'll get 43.584 millimeters of mercury. Um, which would represent 4.6 kilometers above sea level. So this is the atmospheric pressure. Um, it's like the force that you would feel against you um, from all directions if you were 4.6 kilometers above sea level. Um, any questions on what we did here? Okay, so I picked this one specifically because T is not a time. Um, T in this case is how um, how much we're increasing by, which is in kilometers. So in this case, for every additional kilometer, we're losing 11.8% um, of pressure. Okay, so if I wanted to do the opposite, I wanted to find how much distance above sea level um, we would need to be in order to have an atmospheric pressure of 11, or sorry, of 100 millimeters of mercury. I can do the same formula and just solve for time instead. Um, so I've plugged in 100 millimeters of mercury for what my pressure should be. Um, and to solve for time, I'm going to divide both sides by 753. Take the natural log of both sides. That gives me ln of 100 over 753. Divide by my rate. So divide by negative 0.118 and get my time. Now with properties of logarithms, because I'm dividing with the same base, um, I can expand those by subtracting. Um, so this would be ln 100 minus ln 753 over my rate, negative 0.118. Um, those rates are always going to be converted to decimals. Okay, and although this is T, um, this would be measured in kilometers. Do we just keep our answers like that? Like ln, mi LN 100 minus that one? Um, I'm okay if you do. Um, if you do want to get a decimal, we can do that too. Um, so you can plug that into a calculator and get a decimal. I guess I don't really need to show that. Um, any other questions here? Okay. 
And I'm going to do one more with you guys. Um, so I've got a cup of coffee that's cooling at a rate proportional to the difference between the constant room temperature and the temperature of the coffee. The cooling rate is 2.7% per, per minute, and the current temperature of the coffee is 73.8 degrees Celsius. I want to know what the temperature of the coffee will be 30 minutes from now. Um, I just realized I can't type when I'm in full screen like this, so I guess I am in a handwrite. Okay, so I'll handwrite up here. Um, we've got... Our temperature of the coffee at any time would be equal to, so there's room temperature, and I'm never going to go below room temperature, um, so I'm always going to have this 20, plus um, the rest of this is my A equals pert. Um, I would start at some measure of degrees above 20, um, so the current temperature of the coffee is 73.8 degrees Celsius, so that's 73.8. E to the RT, so that's negative 2.7 as a decimal, 0 0.027 times T. Okay, I'm going to rewrite this. I think I'm going to blow this up, so it's hard to see what I'm handwriting. There we go. Can I get it so we can see the picture too? Yeah. Okay, so I've got. Um, our current temperature at this time um, is equal to, we have 20 degrees for the room temperature plus um, we started at 73.8 degrees um, for the coffee, minus the 20 degrees that's in the room temperature, times e to the negative 0 0.027 T. Okay, this is a little bit weird. Do I have any questions about what's going on for this first line? If you're going to subtract 20, you can just not write plus 20 and just write 73.8. Um, we can't because if you just write 73.8 here for the coefficient, um, this exponential function, if t is infinity, will go down to zero, which means the coffee will keep cooling even after it passes room temperature, which isn't true, right? Um, so these 20s will not cancel because um, I am multiplying this part. So with order of operations, if I'm multiplying this whole part by this e to the t, I would have to do that multiplication first before I can do this addition. So I can't just say 20 minus 20 and cancel. Um, but logically, the reason why I've set this up like this is because um, our temperature of the coffee is going to keep decreasing um, to get closer and closer to the room temperature, not zero degrees Celsius. So if we do other problems, we also got to do similar to this up here, like for example, minus 500 and plus 500, like this. Uh, I'm sorry, where's the 500 coming from? Oh no, I'm just giving an example. So for example, if there is a certain limit, we just subtracted from our original number and then add it later on like shown here? Yes, so normally your exponential function is going to um, approach zero. If you don't want your exponential function to approach zero, if you want your exponential function to approach a lower limit, so in this case 20 degrees Celsius. Write that again, 20 degrees Celsius. I don't want the temperature of the coffee to get below 20 degrees Celsius, the room temperature. It will approach the room temperature instead. Um, so then I'm going to add to 0, um, so this would be a of t plus 0. Um, so if I um, add to 0 here, um, I'll be at 20. And then once this e raised to a negative rate times time um, approaches t equals infinity, this term will ap approach 0, and I'll be left with 20 degrees Celsius as the temperature of the coffee. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to keep going. Uh, Mr. Brenda. Yes. Like, is the R always going to be negative? Like, if it's like, if like any number is written in the like how many percent, will it always be negative when you multiply it with time? 
Not necessarily. It depends on whether your um, whether your value is decreasing or increasing. Um, so, for instance, if I had a population growth, um, so if I go back to my bacteria example, where we've got a bunch of bacteria that's multiplying in a petri dish, um, then that rate is going to increase, right? Um, so, if my population is increasing, then that would be a positive rate. Um, in this case, though, our temperature is decreasing. We are cooling. Um, so if I'm cooling oh. by 2.7 percent per minute, and that tells me this rate should be negative. Okay. Okay. Good question. So I'm going to keep going. Um, I've got 20 plus. That's 53.8. Um, e to my rate. Um, and I actually know I'm looking for the temperature 30 minutes from now. Um, and that cooling rate is per minute. Um, so this will be, I'm looking for my temperature 30 minutes from now, and T is 30. Okay, um, so now we can just plug in. Um, so I've got 20 plus um, 53.8 um, times e raised to the negative 0 0.027 is 2.7 percent um, times 30. So decreasing by that rate every minute for 30 minutes. Gives me a temperature of 43.93 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, any questions on anything we did today? Um. All right. Do we also round to two decimal points? Um, again, I'm not that concerned with rounding in this class, so I'm sure if you want to, you can round to two decimal points. Okay. Um, later on, if you keep going into physics, we'll start worrying about significant figures, but... Um, for right now, I'm more concerned about your process than I'm about your actual answers. Um, when you guys, so Friday is your test review. Um, on Tuesday, your actual tests will be due. Um, so when you guys are doing your tests, um, your answers will only be worth part of the points. Um, I've got a rubric where I'm grading you for each individual step. Um, so your answers actually aren't the most important and aren't worth the most amount of credit out of what I'm actually grading you for. It's your process I'm more concerned about. All right, um, so if there, if there aren't any more questions, I do have the homework file which I've sent on Skype and WeChat, um, which will be due on Friday at 9 a.m. Um, we do have a change in the time for this. Um, so all of the teachers have been asked to, um, if they have any classes that are outside normal school hours, move them back into school hours. Um, so that means I need to move this back into our normal block four time. Um, right now my plan is um, I'm going to stick to Fridays and do two o'clock. Um, however, I understand that some of you have other classes that, that will conflict with. Um, so I will be offering kind of a QA session um, on B days. Um, where you guys will have a chance to ask questions on B-Days as well. That will not happen tomorrow because we've already done this session. Um, so our first B-Day that that'll happen for is on Monday. Um, if anyone from a B-Day class that couldn't come to 8 a wants to ask questions, I'll be here also at 2 o'clock on B-Days, um, just for a couple minutes to ask any questions about the live session recordings. Wait, so then our homework... The one that you assigned on course size, when is it due? Is it due tomorrow or due on Friday? Um, so the homework uploaded to course sites will be due on Friday at 9 a.m. 